What would a strong and healthy democratic backbone look like if we built it from scratch? When we look around the world and back through history, there are seven models to choose from. You decide. Number one, the it's a consumer product to be bought and sold like t-shirts business model model. Number two, the state owned and operated news model. Hard pass on that one. Number three, the support from benevolent billionaires model. If we need to discuss the issues with this, we have deeper problems. But you can read the Washington Post or search Peter Thiel Gawker if the problems with this one aren't obvious. This is also actually a significant part of what we currently have in America. Number four, the citizens journalist blogger model. Although there are some amazing people out there doing amazing work, it's simply not enough. This model is just not robust, consistent, or reliable enough to provide the foundational backbone that a society needs. Number five, the paywall or membership model. Paywalls have been referred to as the Hail Mary pass for the industry's survival. Amidst journalism's collapse, this is an ever-increasing way that's used to fund news. However, the evidence does not look good for digital subscriptions, memberships, and paywalls saving and curing our backbone. First, most outlets that use paywalls find that the revenues from this don't come close to making up for the massive losses of advertising dollars that are drawn away by the gravity of Facebook and Google. The New York Times may be one of the exceptions that you think of, but they also sell your online data a lot to supplement their revenue, which is another increasing practice of online news today. In fact, a study conducted by media scholar Victor Picard and computer scientist Tim Liebert showed that news organizations are among the worst culprits in exposing their readers to third-party advertisers and data brokers. They found that browsing news-related websites exposed readers to more than twice as much tracking as the rest of the web. The rest of the web had an average of eight third parties that the sites shared your data with, just eight. News-related websites, on the other hand, had an average of 19 third parties, and they found that the New York Times subjected readers to about 44 third parties. Plus, how many people will honestly pay for more than one or two subscriptions? This causes a further narrowing down and limiting of the type of news that people are exposed to, creating more polarization, information silos, and echo chambers. Quality journalism, the essential information that breathes life into our democracy, should not rely on policing its distribution or pay barriers or pushing an already failing and overly commercialized system to become even more so. Lastly, and maybe most importantly, this model obviously leaves out all the people who just can't afford the subscription. It continues to treat journalism as a privileged commodity, a product, instead of the people's most precious possession and an essential public service in a properly functioning democracy. Number six, the nonprofit and donations model. This model includes news supported by charities, foundations, and reader donations. This model does have the advantage of reducing the type of problems that come with model number one, but not eliminating them. The two main types of nonprofits are public charities and private foundations. They make up about 80% of the nonprofit world, with charities being by far the largest chunk. A charity has a stated public service purpose that they need to adhere to. Despite the name, they are still allowed to make a profit, but instead of distributing this profit to owners and shareholders, they are required to distribute this money back into the organization and its stated purpose. This reduces some of the major pressures and influences of model number one. A foundation, the second largest part of this model, is a nonprofit that is basically a grant-making entity that gives their funding or grants to other nonprofits like charities. And this is where corporate and large interests can exert their influence. Foundations can be and usually are a major source of funding behind many nonprofit charities, and behind the foundations are often large donors such as corporations, wealthy families, and individuals. It's also a very concentrated club. About 70% of grants distributed for national news nonprofits came from just two dozen institutional funders. Private foundations is also where the benevolent billionaire and nonprofit model overlap in a way that is hard to see because foundations are private and don't need to reveal their sources of funds. Also, and this is no small detail, foundation grants most of the time come with expectations about the kind of news that the grant will support. Even donors with good intentions tend to only focus on specific issues and agendas. Relying on foundation support can put nonprofit news outlets 
under specific strings and metrics attached to grants, including sunset provisions and the expectations of measurable impacts. Some critics and scholars like Victor Picard, Rodney Benson, and Anya Schifrin rightly question how different this journalism is in practice from commercialized journalism, and if it still mainly just serves elite groups. As Rodney Benson put it, quote, foundations are shown to place many nonprofits in a catch-22 because of the competing demands to achieve both economic sustainability and civic impact, ultimately creating pressures to reproduce dominant commercial media news practices or orient news primarily for small elite audiences." End quote. With that said, however, this model does manage to support good journalism and promising results at times. It provides various levels of support for a numerous range of news operations. Here are some examples, however you feel about them, these are news outlets supported at least in part by this model. The International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, that's the small group that did the Panama Papers investigation and more recently the Pandora Papers. The Center for Public Integrity, the Institute for Nonprofit News, the Pontier Institute, ProPublica, the Marshall Project, Pew Research Center, Center for Investigative Reporting, Reporters Without Borders, Fairness and Accuracy Reported, and Consumer Reports, to name a few. But, and maybe the most important part about this model, is that several analyses show that there is simply not enough charity to go around. A 2014 Pew Research report showed that this model accounted for about 1% of overall financial support for news. Supporting journalism at a systemic level requires tens of billions of dollars. Not to mention that the backbone of our democracy should not need to rely on charity. Lastly, number seven, the public media model. This model happens to be the model that dominates the top 10 of the World Press Freedom Index, as well as reporting some of the highest levels of trust by the publics that it serves. In one study by Pew Research, all eight countries surveyed expressed that the most trusted news outlet in each country was the public news organization. The public media model is also, arguably, the media model that our founding fathers wanted us to have. In talking about the foundational U.S. press that was originally intended and the strong backbone of democracy that our founders envisioned for us, few people show up as much as Thomas Jefferson. As Victor Picard put it, quotes of Thomas Jefferson make up a greatest hits list for why democracy depends on a well-informed populace. In one of his most famous statements about the press, Jefferson wrote in a letter in 1797, quote, the basis of our governments being the opinion of the people, the very first object should be to keep that right. And were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. But I should mean that every man should receive those papers and be capable of reading them. End quote. Other founding fathers of our republic generally shared Jefferson's view that the foundation of self-governance was based on a society having access to reliable information. James Madison said, quote, a popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy or perhaps both, end quote. In the time of these founding fathers, the postal service was synonymous with the news. The postal system served first and foremost as a news delivery infrastructure. Private letters were secondary. As much as 70% of mail delivered in the 1790s and 95% in the 1830s consisted of newspapers. So, in the first ever major U.S. media policy debate, the founders of the U.S. government argued decisively that the postal system should not have to pay for itself. Remarkably, the debate at the time range from those of George Washington, who believed that the postal fees should be completely waived for all news material, and those of James Madison, who thought the system should just be heavily subsidized. James Madison's position ultimately prevailed and was made into law with the Post Office Act of 1792. This was a resounding rejection by our founders of the idea that the post office should be a self-sustaining business. They obviously valued the postal system's news delivery purposes over economic considerations. So they reasoned and decided to heavily subsidize it. Given the postal system's vital function in their newly born democracy, the founding fathers regarded the idea that it should be a self-supporting business as nonsensical. 
a nonsensical idea, by the way, that the Confederate states actually wrote into their constitution, which led to disaster. But that's a different rabbit hole. Because the postal system was the news and information infrastructure upon which our self-governing society depended, policymakers determined that it was in society's best interest to directly subsidize it. This publicly funded infrastructure included a vast network of postal roads and became the largest employer in the United States. As Winifred Gallagher described it in her popular book, How the Post Office Created America, the newly created postal commons served as the, quote, central nervous system to circulate news throughout the new body politic, end quote. This system depended on massive subsidies worth billions of dollars today, but we've forgotten these ideas and sentiments of our founders. Today, we need to look to other countries to find them. The World Press Freedom Index is a world-renowned index used by diplomats and international entities like the UN and the World Bank. Published every year since 2002 by Reporters Without Borders, it ranks 180 countries according to the level of freedom afforded to journalists and the press in each country. There are only five countries in the world who have remained in the top 10 of this list for all 20 years of its existence. Denmark, Finland, Netherlands, Norway, and Switzerland. These same countries also happen to dominate a completely separate list of public trust in the media. The Digital News Report, which is published annually by the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at Oxford. These same countries represent four out of the top spots on that list. These countries also happen to rely heavily on the public media model. Norway's public service broadcaster, NRK, continues to retain its central position in the Norwegian news landscape as the most used news source offline and the second most used one online, as well as the most trusted Norwegian news brand. In the Netherlands, public broadcasting remains by far the most widely used news source across all platforms, as well as the most trusted in the world. Three quarters of the Dutch population believe public broadcasting provisions are important for the country. In Switzerland, as reported by publicmediaalliance.org, quote, Switzerland's public broadcasting corporation of four regional broadcasters and one online news service is a key example of strong public media in Europe. The Swiss public broadcaster is unique in what it offers Swiss society. It produces high quality and relevant content that would otherwise be unavailable through the small Swiss media market and does so across all language regions in the country. With most of Switzerland's population and wealth concentrated in the German speaking areas, there are concerns that the wider media industry and content would be skewed towards that audience if SRG SSR failed to exist." End quote. And when a recent commercially backed government proposal for cutting Switzerland's public broadcasting funding was voted on, 71% of Switzerland voters said no. Denmark's two dominant actors are the public service broadcasters, Denmark's radio or DR and TV2 on the one hand, and daily newspapers, most owned by foundations and some commercial ownership, on the other hand. DR is widely praised in Denmark. According to Media Power Monitor, DR reaches about 92% of Denmark's population. DR's news programs in particular are consistently praised by Danes as the most credible sources of information, trusted by 80% of Danes. And finally, Finland. Finland was ranked number one on the World Press Freedom Index for seven years in a row currently sitting at number two behind Norway and is number one in trust on the previously mentioned digital news report and has been for the past five years in a row. In Finland, TV is the most popular medium and the Finnish public service broadcaster, YLE's flagship TV1, is the most watched channel. And the third most popular website is that of YLE. Since 2013, YLE has been financed by a tax paid by individuals and companies. On YLE's website, it says, quote, the current financing model safeguards Wiley's independence and ensures that the organization is financed directly by its owners, Finnish taxpayers, end quote. Meanwhile, in America, the most well-known media subsidy is, of course, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which supports NPR and PBS. At present levels, the federal government funds the CPB at a rate of about $450 million a year, and many American politicians want to cut that. For comparison, the same American government spends on average $626 million per year and employs around 2,000 media workers on the Pentagon's public relations budget. Here's a chart of countries showing their amount of funding for their backbone. Japan, 
Britain and Northern European countries spend between 50 to well over $100 per capita per year on public media. The United States government spends about $1.40. The United States is a global outlier among leading democracies. While many of the countries mentioned and countries around the world have mixed systems and varying degrees of these models, with at least the strong presence of the public media model, it puts pressure on the other models in the ecosystem to produce better content. And now to the only criticism of the public media model. Isn't this going to turn into the state-owned and operated model? Obviously not. Do the countries I mentioned seem totalitarian or authoritarian to you? We can and should make laws that specifically protect it from that fear. Like any infiltration by an intelligence agency will be strictly prohibited and punished with jail time. We can ban PR firms from public media outlets. You can also have the key figures who manage it not be appointed by politicians. And key to the whole thing is to give it funding not allocated by Congress, which was the fatal flaw in its design in America and left it vulnerable to constant budget fights and political attacks. Funding options could include taxes on electronics and devices, something similar to what the BBC has, which produces some of the best documentaries in the world. We could actually charge big media corporations for using our public airwaves property yeah, TV spectrum sales are worth tens of billions of dollars. We could find a good portion of the funds right there, but we actually charge commercial broadcasters a whopping nothing for their use of our public property, public airwaves. That's right, lobbyists and election campaigns have made sure that Congress compels the FCC to give our property away 24 hours a day, all year, for free. Other obvious funding options are we are the only country who can directly tax the very duopoly that are the major contributors to journalism's demise around the world. Facebook and Google could pay a meager public media tax of 1% on their net income, which based on their 2019 net incomes could generate a combined $520 million. We could tax digital advertising more broadly, potentially yielding $2 billion a year. There's a whole toolbox here to fund our backbone if we want to. I think we should use all of them given the importance of what we're talking about. We can never properly fix America if we don't properly fix what our entire society is based on, but have no doubt that this will scare lots of powerful forces who benefit from and like things just the way they are. And there will be lots of pushback like there was in the 30s, the 40s, and again in the 60s. But let this be the generation that actually succeeds in curing the cancer in our spine. We can do this, we need to do this. So how? By using all of our other weapons. Whatever your issue is, put it aside for now, just for now, and make this our collective first priority. Because your issue, whatever it is, will not get proper attention without this being fixed first. This is the tree trunk to our tree. If all community and grassroots organizations, talking heads and influencers of conscious made this issue number one, we can make a laser of focus. Stop waiting on politicians to present a platform to choose from. Make this our platform. Make this the conversation you talk about incessantly. Force politicians to make this part of their platform and vote against anyone who doesn't. And importantly, no negotiations with the government or corporations. This is our backbone and the basis of our democratic society and it is not negotiable. And if necessary, and it probably will be, protests and demonstrations of nonviolent disobedience. Here, I imagine a sea of people with newspapers and pens in both hands and one clear and singular message. Fund and protect the backbone of our democracy. We need this now maybe more than ever. Democracy dies in the darkness, but it's better to light one candle than curse the darkness.